Well, I want to uh, welcome everyone here tonight for this uh, special lecture on Iraq. I'm going to take a few moments to introduce our guest, but first, I want to tell you a bit about the Institute for Iraqi Studies, which is uh, newly instituted at BU. We just got things cranked up. Um, we inaugurated the Institute for Iraqi Studies in 2010, and uh, we've been organizing things since then, and uh, this year we've begun to crank up our repertoire programs, including a, a workshop earlier in the year in which we had some uh, really interesting discussions. And uh, we plan to have uh, another workshop next year, maybe even two, and uh, watch for announcements about those. Uh, we are planning a special program for next year called Iraq Plus 10, which is to say our intention is to spend not just an evening or a conference day talking about Iraq, but to have a conversation over the course of the year, and of course marking the one decade anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. And uh, what we would like to do is not so much refight all battles about the merits or demerits of doing this or that, but instead to look at the consequences of the invasion, both regionally and uh, internationally, as well as internally. So we'll have a series of meetings in that regard next year, culminating in a major conference at the end of the year. And I'm pleased to say that um, a variety of local institutions are participating in this, although the, the base for the program will be here at BU. Uh, we will have participation from Boston College, participation from Tufts University, uh, and also from MIT. So um, you'll see this begin to uh, emerge. I'm sorry, in a flurry of notices and invitations beginning in September and continuing throughout the year. And, um, and that will also include uh, several, several lectures by esteemed speakers, as well as opportunities for younger scholars to spend some time with us and to share their research findings about contemporary Iraq. So I hope you look forward to that, and I hope that all of you will be participating in those events in the coming year. Uh, I would also like to take time to welcome uh, our first resident fellow at the Institute for Iraqi Studies. We've named two uh, non-resident fellows, but now for the first time we have a resident fellow who's come all the way from the University of Basra in southern Iraq, and he's right down here in front. Please, if you stand up so everybody can recognize Professor Wasir Shara, who, <clears throat> who made that long journey and uh, arrived in Boston last Friday, and uh, looks like he's, uh, he's fitting right in. You look very well rested, and we look forward to <laughs> having many discussions with you. And uh, of course, our new fellow will be working on some of his own research, but we hope also will be engaged in uh, a series of discussions and perhaps uh, workshops and luncheon sessions and so on with, uh, with many of you and with many others around the campus. So very much a uh, hearty welcome to you, uh, you Professor so Rusty. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Emeritus of Politics and Sociology, Birbeck College, Sami Zabedi, uh, Sami Zabeda, as we often say in, uh, in uh, Western circles, uh, who is uh, quite well known to many of you, if not in person, certainly from his writings. Um, his books, Islam, the People, and the State, uh, have been widely read, read by scholars, read by many, many students, I think Islam, the people in the state, for example, is in its third edition, and if my count is correct, has been translated into four or five other uh, foreign language editions and so on. Uh, our speaker is also a great expert on matters culinary, uh, not least Middle Eastern cuisines, and if you haven't read the book that he co-edited, A Taste of Time, I suggest you take a look at it. I had the Great pleasure one evening of being with uh, uh, Sammy in a restaurant in Paris, and uh, it was a nice seafood restaurant, <clears throat> and I'd never before eaten sea urchin. And um, 
Oh, I might have tried it once before and really quite hated it, I think. But in any event, <laughs> under, the, under the tutelage of our speaker, I learned how to properly enjoy urchin and to season it with the right amount of lemon and so on, and ended up feeling not only well fed and fed it that evening, but very well educated about cuisine. So um, that's not the subject of his talk today, uh, but it's a, um, it's a talent and an interest that he's uh, well renowned for. Uh, he's also the author of Law and Power in the Islamic World. This has also been translated in several other languages. I know Turkish and Danish, and I believe uh, uh, Arabic as well. Uh, and most recently, a book that just came out in 2011, Beyond Islam, A New Understanding uh, of the Middle East. So it gives me great delight to uh, introduce to you tonight Sami Zabeta, who's going to spend some time with us talking about communalism and such in Iraq. And we'll also take time to, uh, to explore some questions with him and to uh, have a dialogue after his presentation, and then informally perhaps to chat uh, after the lecture for those of you who are able to, uh, to linger a bit. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to turn over the floor to Dr. Sammy Zabeta. Welcome, Sammy. Thank you. Well, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for this kind introduction and for inviting me. Um, Iraq in the 20th century saw the development of a complex and variegated society important parts of which can be characterized as civil. And I hesitate to speak about civil society in the presence of uh, 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 Professor uh, Richard here, who has written a great deal, um, a great, uh, uh, with a great scholarship on, the, uh, on civil society. I use civil society to indicate social formations of citizens and sectors aspiring to citizenship and the national public life. This is in contrast to a society of communities and sects based on religion, tribe, kinship, and locality. These communalistic formations are typically based on authority, narrow solidarity, and demands of allegiance. The authority is patriarchal and traditional in that it requires allegiance and obedience to chiefs, prelates, and heads of household. Civil society formations are typically based on voluntary associations of individuals on the basis of common interests, pursuits, and ideologies. All historical societies are of the communalistic type, and citizenship and civil society are mostly products of modernity, but by no means always dominant in modern societies. Elements of communal formations and authoritarianism are common in the modern world and in many instances dominant. Iraq is no exception. The elements of civil society and aspirations to citizenship which developed in the 20th century existed in an ambient environment of communal and sectarian formations which always subverted and threatened it. Paradoxically, civil society often presented in distinction from the state is in crucial respects the products of the modern state and the citizens are primarily its bureaucrats, professionals, and products of its educational system and public life. Yet it is the authoritarian and repressive regimes of the modern state which have systematically subverted the state as a structure of institutions and laws and the civil society which it created. So here, I think we should make a distinction, which is not mine, it's commonly made a distinction between the state and the regime. The state in uh, the sense of um, institution, of law, of uh, uh, representative bodies, of uh, uh, judicial systems and so on, uh, as against the regime, which is the uh, actual governing cliques who, in the case of the Middle East and uh, until the present time in many parts uh, of the Arab world, 
uh, have bypassed the state as institutions, that in fact you have the informal relationships of kinships, the networks of patronage, the crony capitalism, and so on, all of which have been important features exposed in the recent uh, uprisings and rebellions in many uh, parts of the Middle East uh, and the way in which uh, these cliques uh, then subvert the state in favor of personalistic networks. Even uh, military rank and military hierarchy can often be subverted by these relationships of uh, personal uh, and kinship and, uh, and uh, um, patrimonial connections. The Ba'ath regime in Iraq from its inception in 1968 acted to suppress all alternative sources of solidarity and difference in its effort to forge a common and total allegiance to the Ba'ath party and the regime. In so doing, it undermined the communalistic and religious formations in favor of individuation. So in a sense, it acted uh, against the uh, prevailing patriarchal cultures, because these patriarchal cultures were themselves bases of solidarity, uh, which interfered with the uh, uh, loyalty and allegiance to the state and the party. So in many respects, then, some of the what, was, what is seen as being the uh, kind of modernizing, progressive impact of the Ba'ath rule, especially in the 1970s and into the 1980s, uh, was uh, in part uh, a thrust to ensure loyalty and allegiance to party and state as against the uh, communalistic uh, uh, networks uh, that, that prevailed. And part of that was, of course, uh, liberal, um, uh, what seemed to be uh, a liberal uh, outlook on questions of family, of the liberation of uh, women, on women's place in society, and so on. So in many respects, despite the violent repression that went on throughout the Ba'ath rule, uh, on the question of family law and on women, it was fairly favorable until the disasters that came with the wars in the 1980s and the 1990s, in which, uh, as we know, there was a reversal uh, of all this. If I have time, I'll talk more about it presently. Um, <clears throat> yet by suppressing all avenues of social association and action, other than those of the regime, it also eliminated civil society. The atomized and frightened individuals it created were apt to return and recreate the bonds of family, community, and religion as the only form of social security and protection in the face of violent regime. In the, what I've written um, recently, I've I'd employed the uh, concept of uh, uh, solidarity groups. This is following my old teacher, Norbert Elias. Um, and the idea of solidarity groups is in the absence of a strong state, uh, of state provision, of security, of livelihood, uh, of uh, controlling the use of violence, and so on, uh, then many individuals then are driven into solidarity groups, groups of kinship, uh, of uh, locality and community, of tribe, of protection through warlords and uh, magnates and strong men. Uh, Ilias was uh, writing about this in the context of feudal Europe in the process of the development into modernity and the centralized state. But in many respects, we can look at many of the uh, societies today, and especially in the Middle East, in terms of this recreation of solidarity groups. I mean, that was historically, of course, um, uh, the, the locality, the tribe, the kinship was the whole world for many people, uh, especially in the rural areas. And it's really with, the, with modernity, with the development of the modern state, with the extension of security, of welfare services, of education, of health, that in fact the, these, there is a process of individualization 
from these groups. Uh, and uh, that happened in the first half of the 20th century and into the 1970s and 80s in many countries uh, in the Middle East and continued to happen some places like uh, Turkey and even Iran. Uh, but in fact, what you see then is a reversal that, in fact, with the uh, uh, processes of uh, privatization, neoliberalism, in the case of Iraq, of the successive destructive wars in the 1980s and the 1990s, followed by the sanction regime, is that the state and the state services and the state functions, however repressive they may be in terms of protection, of security, of provision, and so on, are withdrawn. Uh, and uh, the violence and repression is intensified. So in fact, the hope, the uh, life chances of individuals in terms of security and in terms of livelihood then revolves more and more around the uh, survival units, the units uh, that are formed on the basis of kinship and religion and locality. Um, the modern state, journalism and print capitalism, in the words uh, of um, Benedict Anderson, political parties, educational institutions, the professions, and modern sectors of business all produced their intelligentsia of personnel, at least partly liberated from the bonds and horizons of kinship and primary loyalties, many with ideologically framed aspirations pertaining to the nation and the future. Reading the memoirs of public figures and literati of the early 20th century, we find accounts of these groups, their journals and political ambitions, their venues of, and salons of, and cafes, their conspiracies and intrigues, and the conflicts that culminated in repression and violence. Um, now, I think this, this milieu is, is, in the case of Iraq, well illustrated in the uh, life and memoirs of the characters uh, the uh, journalists, the literary figures of the first half of the 20th century. And, you know, if we, I've been interested in the poets and the importance of uh, poetry in public life in, uh, uh, in Iraq uh, and uh, uh, the way in which it had punctuated the various aspects of Iraqi politics and society. And we see in the earlier poets who started in the late 19th century as Ottomans, like um, uh, Ma'roof al-Rusafi uh, and Jamil Sadqi Zahawi, both of whom uh, had been uh, members of the Ottoman parliament, both of whom had been parts of the Young Turk movements and the Ottoman uh, uh, process of uh, modernization, liberalization, constitutionalism, liberation of women, and both in one way or another got into trouble uh, in this process. And in Iraq, then in the early independent Iraq of the first half of the 20th century, they together with many other similar figures in journalism and literature and in public life were involved in uh, this process, this ferment, uh, this uh, controversy and argument uh, which characterized public space, and all of it was really directed at the creation of this uh, world of citizenship, this world of public participation. And they're all trying desperately to get away from the ghettos of community and of uh, uh, family and tribe, and in many ways satirizing it. So you have, for instance, the other very important poet of the 20th century, a later one who, whose life coincided with the 20th century, was uh, Muhammad Mahdi Jawahari. Uh, Jawahari uh, was from uh, Najaf, from a, a family of religious ulama who uh, uh, came into prominent, prominence through his uh, uh, poetry, who uh, uh, first of all was adopted by King Faisal I and became a court official for two or three years uh, and then rebelled against that and antagonized the king and the court and then he proceeded to antagonize his, uh, the, the associates of his family in Najaf because 
the project to open a girls' school in Najaf was vetoed by the ulama, and he wrote a famous poem called Al Raj'ayun, the, the, the reactionaries, in which he writes biting satire uh, of, the, uh, of the ulama who were doing this. Uh, including allusions uh, to their pederasty and, and corruption in many ways. And uh, he got into real trouble. I mean, that's one reason why the king had to let him go, because he got into trouble with the, uh, the Shiite establishment of Najaf. So here is someone who is from that milieu, who is deeply imbued with the culture of Najaf and of the, uh, the Hausa and the uh, literary background there but at the same time uh, struggling to get away from the uh, aspects of it which, were, which he saw as socially backwards. And this was so common among so many of the people who were involved in public life, in politics, in the professions, uh, from all the communities in the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century and well into the 1970s and 80s and of course till the present time but as I shall say they have been uh, radically suppressed. Um, from the point of view of the ruling cliques of the authoritarian states which invariably developed in the region the ideological politics were threatening because they were aimed at reform and sometimes revolution. They also resorted to mass organization, uh, threatening to bring sectors of the common people into the ideological politics of civil society. I mean, people who say, well, this public life and intellectuals and, and debates and so on were confined to an elite. Of course, that is true. That's true everywhere. But what, is ha what was happening in Iraq was that many of the common people were being brought into uh, this world. Such was the threat of communist organization and mobilization from the 1940s into the 60s and 70s. Ruling cliques, starting with the British, were often happier making deals with tribes and communities to assure their loyalty and cooperation. In repeated conflicts with Kurdish nationalists, for instance, governments always resor resorted to loyal Kurdish tribes to fight on their behalf, loyalties which were often fickle and followed the prevailing winds of power and interest. Religious opinion and confessional loyalties were often mobilized against the supposedly atheist communists, and of course, primordial loyalties of clan and patronage were often the base of the ruling clique themselves. Now, we come to sectarian politics. Sunnis and Shi'is. Neither of these religious groups form homogeneous social, cultural, or political entities. Common narratives of modern Iraqi history contend that the Sunnah took over the rule of modern Iraq from the Ottomans, then favored by the Br British mandate, excluding and marginalizing Shia and Kurds, culminating in predominantly Sunni rule of Saddam and the Ba'ath. This requires serious qualifications. I think there is no question that uh, the uh, Shia of Iraq uh, in general uh, were um, uh, inferior in terms of opportunities, in terms of uh, official positions, and uh, I'll talk about that more in a minute. The Sunni elites of Ottoman rule and of the monarchical regime till 1958 were worlds apart from the previously poor and depressed tribal Sunnis of the western provinces from whom military and Ba'athi rule was drawn. The first were notable and land-owning families of Baghdad and Mosul, who would have looked down with contempt on the poor and backwards tribes of those regions. Most important, Sunnis of Baghdad and the main cities were prominently represented among the intelligentsia 
and the professional classes, alongside members from all other communities, and with easy mixing, sociability, and even intermarriage. But there was, however, always those people who were into modernizing uh, the country, uh, into liberation, individualization, and so on, uh, who were more or less uh, uh, unhappy with religious dominance, tended to be more unhappy with the Shia than with the Sunnis. This is true, of course, was of, uh, true of, of the poet I referred to, Maruf al Rosafi, who was rabidly anti Shia. But he wasn't anti Shia because he was a Sunni uh, or because uh, he was sort of sectarian in that respect. He was against the Shia because he thought the Shia were the uh, most ingrained religious obscurantists and therefore irremediably backwards. And that, I think, was true of uh, uh, many others who were not themselves sectarian, but who saw Shiaism as being much more ingrained in, as a religion. And of course, they were, which I'll come to talk about in a minute, the question of the Shiite institutions. Um, then we have what you call the myth of non-sectarianism. Older Iraqis, many Iraqis today will tell you now with regret that Iraqis were non-sectarian and mixed together without knowing who was who in terms of community and sect, which is an exaggeration. Then they are referring to this class, the urban educated middle class. And it's precisely this class that has been repeatedly attacked, repressed, impoverished, and many of its ranks driven into exile, first by the Ba'ath regime and subsequently by the chaos and violence that followed the invasion in 2003. As such, the Sunni intelligentsia suffered as much from the supposedly Sunni regime as any of their colleagues. We come to the Shia. Their educated cadres contributed equally to this class with its activities, with more of their middle classes being involved in trade and business. That is one sector of the Shia. The numerical majority of the Shia were the poor, tribalized peasants of the south and of the marshes. Uh, the marsh Arabs featured in the news in the tragic context of the ecological vandalism of the drainage of their marshes by the Saddam regime. From the time of the British mandates, the sheikhs of these tribes, converted into vast landowners since late Ottoman times, came to assume elite roles in the new state, a Shiite component of the power elite under the, mor under the monarchy. They were partially dispossessed and relegated by the waves of land reforms from 1958 till the 1970s. Some were subsequently rehabilitated in the last decades of the Ba'ath with the revival of tribalism as a means of regime security. The poor peasants migrated to Baghdad and other cities in large numbers from the 1940s, escaping rural poverty into urban slums. In Baghdad, their shanty, towns were, was, their shanty town was rebuilt as social housing under Qasim. After the invasion, they emerged as the main support base for Muqtada Sadr, the radical cleric and politician. Another important sector of the Shia are the business and finance community. During the first half of the 20th century, Shia merchants shared the Baghdad and other markets with the Jews until the mass exodus of most Jews under pressure, mostly to Israel, in 1951. The Jews represented an important sector of the intelligentsia as well in the professions, the media, music, and government service. Their migration was the first blow to the independent middle classes. Their place in the markets was taken predominantly by Shia, who constituted an important part of the business bourgeoisie with some notable mega-rich families. Shia merchants were also prominent in Basra and in the shrine cities of Najaf and Karbala. It was member of this bourgeoisie which came 
to the hostile attention of the Ba'ath, alongside other Shia groups alleged to be of Iranian affiliation. I was trying to explain this earlier, the quirk of Iraqi nationality law from the inception of the Iraqi state is that at the inception of the Iraqi state, uh, all formerly Ottoman subjects became full Iraqi citizens. Any who had Iranian nationality were classified as Taba'iya Irania, Iranian dependents. Uh, what happened was that th those who, under the Ottomans, especially in the last days of the Ottoman Empire, those who could uh, be classified as non-Ottoman had the advantage of not being subject to the military draft and also uh, of having privileges of foreigners. So many of the Arab families of the South, mostly Shia, registered as Iranians. Uh, uh, so in fact then what happened with the nationality law is that these, all these people, not only them were classified as of Iranian uh, dependency, but all their children to the, into the 20th and the 21st century continued to be classified in that way. Not now, I hope. Um, now, so then this led to waves, especially during the Iran-Iraq War of 1981-88, there were waves of expulsion of Shia groups. Some were poor Kurds, they are one group of Kurds who are Shia. Others were members of rich families, their wealth confiscated to the benefit of regime cronies. After the Jews, another sector of the independent business class was banished. These eliminations and subordination of independent business classes to the benefit of regime cronies were further blows to the formation of civil society. A most important sector of the Shia are the clerical classes of the shrine cities of Negev, Karbala, and Kavum. These constituted the personnel of the religious institutions, including shrines, pilgrimage, schools, mosques, courts, and charities. The leading mujtahids played important roles in the modern history of Iraq, resistance to the British leader, sorry, in the resistance to the British and assumed leadership roles. By the 1940s and 50s, however, religious institutions and personnel suffered the wave of secularization of society, culture, education, and politics, and reacted in various ways. The Shia secular intelligentsia did not have much time for the clerics, as we saw in the case of Jawahiri, and the merchants were ambivalent. And this is very different from Iran, in which there was close association between the merchants uh, and the cleric. Um, now, I'm just wondering how to proceed with the remaining time. Now, having looked at the two main sects, let's look at the politics of sectarianism. Religion, let's first note that religion as a basis for social solidarities and formations has at least two aspects, the religious and the communal. The first is in terms of common faith and observance, the second as a marker of communal belonging and identity. Both these aspects can be politicized. So in fact, what I want to say is that um, the difference between Sunnah and Shia, like the difference between Catholics and Protestants, was always there and was always an important difference in Iraq and in many other places. However, this important difference and often antipathy uh, in certain cases uh, and discrimination in many cases, this did not involve necessarily uh, open antagonism and violence, uh, but it was often politicized. And the politicization of uh, uh, sectarian uh, differences proceeded in different ways at different times uh, in different contexts uh, and that in fact it was really only with the Ba'ath regime um, and in the 1980s and 90s uh, 
uh, and especially in the 1990s, that this uh, politicization uh, breaks into violence, especially after the Intifada that followed the Kuwait War of 1991, uh, in which there was uh, uh, a great deal of repression and violence, and the result of which was uh, a very uh, uh, definite uh, uh, politicization of sectarianism in a way which was quite different from the politicization of sectarianism before, which led to continued conflict and antipathy. One important aspect of this was that the Ba'ath regime had uh, succeeded in suppressing or uh, including the, uh, all aspects of political and civil society. So associations, trade unions, women's organizations, um, all kinds of uh, what existed uh, before the Ba'ath were incorporated into the state or suppressed. The one aspect that the Ba'ath regime could not totally eliminate, one basis of social autonomy that they could not totally suppress was the Shiite religious institutions and all the networks that went along with them. Uh, these had their own finances through the religious Jews, which came not only from Iraq, but from Iran and the Gulf and uh, Afghanistan and India. Uh, they had uh, their own organization in terms of charities and schools. The Ba'ath regime tried to stop all this and to destroy it, and there were much violence and assassinations and uh, rep repression, but they could never totally eliminate this. Now, in this respect, there's a kind of asymmetry between the Sunni and Shia institutions, because the Sunni institutions had always been state-friendly. The Sunni institutions from Ottoman times were part uh, of the uh, state. They never had an autonomous existence, whereas the Shia institutions in both Iran and Iraq and the Gulf had always had their own institutional basis, which was distinct from the state. And I think that was one of the important reasons for, among many others, uh, for the um, Re, uh, the, con the, the antagonism and the repression of regime to the uh, Shiite uh, religious community. So in fact, in many respects, individual Shiites could be part of the regime and were. And indeed, loyalty was quite important in this respect as far as Saddam and the regime were concerned. So it was really not so much the individual Shia it was much more the organized Shia, the Shiite institutions, which after the decline of the nationalist and the communist parties, then became also the basis for political organization, and especially after the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Now, the net effect of the devastating wars and sanction, sanctions from the 1980s until the invasion of 2003, and especially in the 1990s under the sanctions. The effects on government and economy, I think I've already said this, that in fact there is the fragmentation of society, the withdrawal of the state from services, criminality and gangs enjoyed much greater scope for theft, extortion, smuggling and intimidations. Some of these were closely connected to regime personalities and security forces and overlapping regime terror. Political and civil associations had long been eliminated or incorporated by the regime and afforded no sustenance or protection for their members, formerly the educated, the educated middle classes. 
the secular, non-sectarian civil society of the educated middle classes that had been built up as part of the checkered nation building of the earlier decades of the 20th century had reached a point of collapse. It is this society which received the added devastation of the 2003 invasion. So in many respects then, the devastation of the invasion was added as a continuity to what had been happening in the 1990s. Now, I don't know whether I have time to talk about the situation after the uh, invasion. Um, the invasion authority started by sacking the government and the army without replacing them. The chaos that followed is well known, with, among other disasters, several weeks of pillage of public buildings, utilities, and institutions, further undermining infrastructure and governing capacity. Of course, this was attributed by many to a kind of conspiracy by the occupying forces, particularly the Americans. The criminal gangs mixed with elements of the insurgency and security forces of the defunct regime came into their own with the pillage, kidnapping, and extortion. And this affected disproportionately the middle classes. Under these conditions, the fragmentation, the fragmented communities based on locality, kinship, and religion became paramount for the protection of livelihood of the individual. We come back to this idea of the survival unit. The interim governing council put together by the Allied authorities had its membership chosen on the basis of representation of the constituents of the Iraqi population, defined largely in terms of ethnic and sectarian divisions. Those who have argued that sectarian conflict is the product of de deliberate American policy have pointed to this event as proof. Yet given the dissolution of the state and the previous regime's elimination of all political and civil bodies, we may ask what other basis of representations could our authorities have chosen. The collapse of the state and the Ba'ath Party took with it all forms of organization and control, and the subsequent campaign of de removing many functionaries and professionals who were only in the party for career reason, only added to the chaos. Whatever the intentions of the Allies, the actual effect of these arrangements to produce government and politics enmeshed in sectarian division. The Shia parties are, uh, emerged from elections and referenda as the dominant forces, yet not unitary forces. As we know, I won't go into the fragmentation of the uh, Shia groups. What emerged then uh, uh, in by after the bloodbaths of, the of 2006 and 2007 is then the emergence of the strong man who was not recognized as such, uh, the present Prime Minister Maliki, in 2008, who emerged uh, uh, as this strong man, uh, partly with the help uh, of the Americans who are trying to, to uh, are, achieve some kind of stability and control in Iraq in preparation for their uh, leaving uh, and the uh, development of the Iraqi armed forces and the security services and the uh, uh, maneuvering and political uh, electoral uh, pacts and uh, uh, conflicts which led to the control of most of these uh, forces uh, by the center, by the prime minister himself, uh, which is the uh, current situation now in which you have the emergence of another strong center. Paradoxically, um, this, in terms of the constitution that was agreed in 2005, this strong center can be challenged by the provinces because they are the, that constitution allowed for uh, federalist organization and for the uh, provincial units uh, to be able to acquire uh, many powers and controls over resources. So in fact, in reaction to the centralization of power uh, in the hands of the prime minister, uh, some of the other politicians who had been maneuvered out of, the, of control 
then try to use this uh, provincial uh, uh, federalism uh, as a means to counteract. Uh, and as a result, you, that's, you had the uh, warrant for the arrest of Hashemi and others who were the uh, kind of opposition within the government and who were supposed to have uh, ministerial positions within the government on all kinds of trumped up charges and also campaigns of arrests in the uh, provinces to the northwest uh, of Baghdad where these moves for autonomy were being made. So in fact the question now is whether uh, Iraq is on the path to national reunification uh, and unity or quite the contrary to a re-emergence uh, of a uh, centralized repressive government uh, with uh, a, a variety of uh, uh, local uh, and regional powers and militias uh, that try to combat it and in which the uh, common people are uh, the victims of both and in which these uh, survival units that I'm talking about continue to be as important as ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mukhtar and the, and the poor quarters of Baghdad, mm -hmm. where he has a very significant base. And I wonder if you can talk about, uh, if you will, the class dimensions uh, political competition within both the Shi and the Sunni communities, mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, share your own crystal ball as to where you think this competition between the uh, the impoverished underclass mm -hmm. and the more privileged business classes and, and elites mm -hmm. are likely is likely to end up. Well. Um I don't have detailed knowledge of what's going on on the ground in Iraq at the present, only a question of reports. But um, uh, it seems that Muqtada Sadr had been outmaneuvered by uh, uh, Maliki and, and his, his uh, party, uh, and that, in fact, the kind of power base of Muqtada Sadr, was, which was his militias, are no longer an important uh, military force compared to the now strengthened and centralized uh, army and, and security services that have emerged uh, since the days of his power in 2005, 2006 and on. Um, so, I mean, I think the, uh, the political uh, tensions between the different uh, Shia political groups and their constituencies uh, are as important as ever. Uh, and um, I don't know to what extent this uh, kind of ultimate uh, 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 sectarian uh, objectives could can override this internal uh, difference and, and uh, fragmentation. Uh, so I, we can only point to the forces, and I don't know what the outcomes will be. Uh Thank you very much for a, a fascinating and important presentation. I have a, a, a question that's going to sound theoretical, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's really meant to uh, raise the question of whether things over the course of the 20th century, particularly back at the beginning of the 20th century where you began your story, whether they could have been otherwise, had leadership and the state structure been otherwise. So here's my theoretical question, but keep in mind that it's, it's really about outcomes, very concrete outcomes. The theoretical question is that you defined uh, civil society more or less as a citizen society, and you linked at several points in your presentation citizenship to a process of individuation, mm -hmm. which is certainly fine. Uh, there are, of course, others who, who link, see the primary characteristics of civil society as associational life in that great space between family and extended kin units on one hand and the state structures on the other. So you have, and both of those visions 
of civil society or definitions of civil society, I think point to things that are very real and, and you brought them into your discussion, I thought, very effectively. But the reason for me uh, this, re this, this theoretical issue raises an outcome question is it has to do with your characterization of the emergence of a middle class. And so my question is, to sort of focus it, given the emergence of this more self-conscious and individuated middle class in the early decades of the 20th century, was it inevitable that even though many of them, particularly among the writers and artists, thought of themselves as individuals free of traditional solidary ties, was it inevitable as civil society, if you will, reached out and incorporated more people in society, that it in fact became more associational rather than individuated, and the associations themselves became were inevitably to become more colored by the kinds of solidarity units, which of course in Iraqi society as a whole, as in much of Middle Eastern society, had remained quite strong. I hope you can see what I, in other words, yeah, no, yeah, I, I see exactly what you're saying. Uh, but I'm not, I, I hope I didn't give the impression that the individuation was as against associational life. I think individuation is the condition for associational life. Um, because, you know, I mean, the, it's individuals who, who then, the, the whole idea of association is uh, voluntary association. Uh, and so you can only have, I mean, this Adam Smith saw this very clearly. He said, you know, he celebrated commercial society, as he called it, because it was the basis for friendship. Yeah. You know, that in fact, you couldn't, pri prior to commercial society, you could not have friendship because, of course, that was an exaggeration, because uh, people's intimate relationships were all determined by, uh, by their kinship and locality and obligations. Uh, that is, in fact, only commercial society which individualized people made friendships, which are freely chosen friendships, possible. Uh, and that is the case of, uh, he, he was saying exactly the same thing really about associations. And associations are on the basis of common interests, you know, uh, businessmen, um, uh, guilds, uh, syndicates, uh, uh, in economic life, uh, and then all kinds of other political associations, political parties, and so on. Uh, uh, Freemason lodges, which were very important in the 19th and into the 20th century in the Middle East, all these were associations, and were associations in many cases very influential, and especially when they were political parties, including the Young Turks movement itself and including the Iraqi Communist Party, which was very important. Um, so, I don't, I mean, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying that individuation is the condition for associational life. But I guess my question is, and I'll just leave it there, is that, of course, in much of the literature that's critical of, the, of our earlier understandings of civil society, point out that in, across the Middle East, across Africa, across Asia, many voluntary associations, many associations which are at first voluntary, as they become significant social forces in society, actually cease to be voluntary for many people. They become solidarity That's right. yeah. groups. Like, yeah. And yeah. I was wondering if you think that, that was, there was something that could have counteracted that. Oh, sure, Iraq. sure. But then that, that is much more, much more fluid in many ways. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think you can point to let's say, the Communist Party in Italy, uh, which now we talk about uh, Islamist parties as providing uh, charities and social services and so on to members. The Italian Communist Party was doing just that in the years following the Second, Second World War. And there was, what you say would apply to it. You know, then it becomes not so voluntary because, you know, there are all kinds of obligations uh, that are involved there. But then it's subject to the kind of fluxes uh, of, of uh, politics, socioeconomic processes, and so on. Um, I think it's a very different character from uh, sort of a patriarchal kinship relationships. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Zubeda. It seems to me that so far the, the discussion is 
focusing as we talk about sectarianism and, and survival units. It's focusing on the largest sectarian groups in Iraq, which is to say the Sunni Arabs and the Shiite Arabs. And what I can't help but think about is what looking at the smaller sectarian groups other than the Sunni and Shiite Arabs might tell us about the larger sectarian system that's in place. So obviously the Kurds would be the, the most obvious, you know, larger small group, that is to say about 20% of the population. But, but um, yeah, Iraq has a lot of smaller groups as well, including the, yeah. the Chaldeans and Assyrians and the Turkmens and, and various other very small mm -hmm. groups. And it seems to me that as society has fallen back onto what you're calling survival units, that the effects on these much, much smaller groups have been vastly more catastrophic. Um, so what I'm wondering about is, you know, if, if you agree with that, and if, if anything, you know, what does looking at these smaller groups tell us about the sectarian system and broader political trends right now? Yeah. Um, well, you see, I think, you know, what happened, you know, from uh, the time of uh, Ottoman reforms is that uh, the the kind of intelligentsia from all these units, certainly from the Jews and the Christians, uh, and certainly from the Turkomans in Iraq, uh, became very much involved in this class that I'm talking about, the you know the middle class of the intelligentsia of associational life and so on, um, uh, and uh, the the communities themselves uh, were always at a disadvantage in one way or another, you know, because they were always discriminated against in terms of their uh, religion, uh, jobs, social standing, um, you know, I mean, they, uh, but the kind of protection that some of them had or sought were to do with uh, networks of patronage that transcended their communities. So a lot of the Christians in the north of Iraq had Kurdish Muslim landlords, and they were under the protection of these, uh, also under the exploitation of these Muslim Kurdish uh, landlords. So often uh, solidarities and allegiances uh, did not always uh, go according to uh, ethnic or religious identification, but to social networks of patronage and power. And I think that is what has uh, ended. That you know, increasingly the uh, the kind of uh, the emphasis on religion as uh, the definition of identity and allegiance has ended the kind of cross communal relations through patronage and power that you had before. Um, and in many respects, the, uh, these minorities, especially religious minorities, uh, seem their existence is threatened in throughout the uh, the region. Um, so I don't know what else I can say. Uh, last week, uh, Iraq hosted uh, some of the end of uh, the Arab League. Uh, Sorry, can you speak up? I can't hear very well. Uh, last week, uh, Iraq hosted a uh, summit meeting at the Arab League. Uh, yet, the only, uh, I guess, head of state who showed up was Al Saba from uh, Kuwait. Uh, I was wondering if uh, this was kind of emblematic of uh, the rifts between Shia governments and Sunni governments in the region, and that if a uh, possible resolution brokered by uh, Syria, brokered by Iraq, could uh, basically these other regional progress. Can someone repeat? Uh, to me. <laughs> yes, referring to the Arab League meeting that was in Baghdad last week. Yeah. And uh, the fact that very few, or relatively few, heads of state seems to have, seem to have showed up. I think actually there were yes. just ten heads of state. Yeah. Of state. And he's wondering whether or not this is indicative of a continuing uh, Sunni Shia rift. And that, uh, if Iraq could possibly. Yes. You see, I didn't really have. Uh, didn't really didn't speak about the question of Iran and the uh, uh, imposition of sectarian uh, factors on ge the geopolitics of the area. So it's no longer really just a question of the particular countries. Now there are geopolitical maneuverings in the area, especially with relation to Iran, 
uh, which are sectarian. You know, this uh, the Sunni Saudis and Gulf has against uh, Iran and the influence and so on. And the whole question of Syria, of course, as I think you probably know already, and that's why you're asking the question, the whole question of, of Syria is very much bound up with this, you know, that in fact it's uh, uh, the, the attempt to uh, displace the Syrian regime uh, 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 for some is bound up with the question of separating, of weakening Iran, of depriving Iran of its uh, arm to the eastern Mediterranean. Um, uh, and so, and Iraq is very important in this because uh, I mean, the, com the, the influence of Iran in Iraqi politics is uh, considerable, but not uniform because, you know, they, and it's not to do with Shiite support for Iranians, but it's to do with uh, various kinds of uh, power struggles between different uh, regions and factions. Uh, and uh, so, you know, one idea, or I think it was one quite distinct possibility is that if Iran was to lose Syria, then its uh, sort of strategic weight in the Arab world would be Iraq. Uh, and it, well, it is Iraq in any case, but it would be much more Iraq. So I think that these are the calculations that are influencing various Arab countries, especially the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. Do a question back there? Yes. I was following the news about the vice president, yeah. he's a Sunni. So the vice president. He's got an arrest warrant for the vice president of Iraq. He's now in Qatar. Yes. I want to, your, uh, if you could comment, how significant is this? Is this a singular issue, or is this, or is this indicative of more further marginalization of the uh, Sunni political yeah. party? Well, I mean, as I understand it, the uh, there was, you know, after the elections in 2010, they were. Uh, a protracted period of negotiation between the parties because the Maliki party, the prime minister's party, did not get the largest number of seats. So they were all kind of protracted negotiations and in the end uh, they managed to uh, form uh, what's called a unity government with Maliki still as uh, prime minister. And, uh, but with all kinds of seeming concessions to these other groups including well, the, the group that's called the Iraqiya, which included both uh, sort of secularists and Sunni uh, elements. Uh, and it seems that the way the arrangements were made uh, continued to put uh, uh, coercive power, you know, armed power, uh, still in the hands of, of Maliki. And so they, these uh, other people who are in the government, including the vice president, were challenging this, trying to change it. And one of the things they were doing is to utilize, at least to my information, that's maybe wrong, to utilize the uh, clauses in the Constitution that gave uh, federal powers to the provinces then to try and get sort of power bases within the provinces. And that is when the uh, uh, arrest warrants were issued against Hashemi and uh, various other uh, personalities of the Iraqiya uh, list, as well as widespread arrests in the, these provinces, in Diyala particularly. Uh, so, you know, that is an attempt really to stifle any possible challenge to the power of the center. Yeah. Uh, that there was a possibility following the U.S. invasion in 2003 to a stable uh, post-Saddam state system in Iraq? And if so, what went wrong that resulted in the long period of sectarian violence and dissent that we know of? You're asking me to do some crystal gazing backwards. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's anybody's guess, really. I mean, I think... Uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, what, I think what the Americans and their allies did, first of all, by invading, and secondly, what they did after the invasion was utter disaster for them as well as everybody else, certainly for Iraq. Uh, so um, the question is whether they could have done it better. 
Uh, I don't think, well, I think they could have done it a bit better, but it would still have been a disaster. Uh, because, you know, here was a society that was, uh, uh, that had been pulverized anyway. With, with, uh, I mean, it all started with the sanction regime in the 1990s, uh, after destructive wars in uh, Iran, Iraq, and then in 1991. So, um, uh, the, to add to that, you know, further invasion and, and destruction of infrastructure and society was not going to produce uh, something wonderful. Thank you very much. I, I just want to comment on this last comment because I have a first hand experience in the field. That was in Iraq when the invasion took place. And then I was appointed as the CEO for the Ministry of Transportation and Communication. Uh, in the first couple of months, uh, we, the Iraqis intellectuals who were in Iraq, were quite uh, capable of restoring a lot of our services. And the ministry started to function, actually. There was no violence in the first couple of months in Iraq, although there was no police force, uh, looting took place, but it was only confined to governmental offices, not to private property at all. It was only after the crea or, or, or first the uh, dismantling the army and all the security forces, which was completely irrational because these people were heavily armed and they send them home without any income. And what do you expect? Two millions of them. Mm. And then the creation of the governing council, which was the real disaster, because these people were inhomogeneous, um, have no experience whatsoever. Well, I couldn't say have no experience, but they didn't understand Iraq because they have left Iraq uh, decades before. And uh, they start struggling for power among themselves. Nobody has any program to rebuild Iraq. They were only struggling who would maximize his, his, his benefits. And that was the disaster. And their differences were reflected on the people and the sectarian terrorism and, and, and violence society. So the American could have done a better job. Definitely they could have be done a much better job. Uh, across the whole talk and across the big news, it's just Sunni, Shi, Kurd. Um, it's all. It's a big question on uh, a big issue is identity itself. Um, do you believe that within the current sphere of divisions in Iraq, whether it's the main groups of Sunni, Shi, Kurd, or even within that the um, divisions within these groups? Do you believe it's possible to see um, a common identity rising of Iraqi, or is this kind of a hopeless situation? And would you see, or would you believe that uh, the identity can rise um, in how many years? I think I don't think there is any doubt whatsoever that there is a very strong identity as Iraqi. I don't think that is something which is at issue. I think what is at issue is how is Iraqi conceived by the different groups. So there is no question that the, the Shia and the Sunnah, the Kurds, are, sorry, the Kurds are a different matter. Let's leave that aside. There is no question that the Shia, uh, Sunnis, Shias, many of the Christians uh, are firmly convinced that they are Iraqis. It's the question of how they want uh, how they want Iraq to be, and so you know they they have different conceptions of how the nation, how its symbols and its govern governance uh, should be, uh, but within uh, undoubted uh, a, a common identification with the territory and the nation that's Iraq. Um, that doesn't make it any better. Uh, doesn't make the uh, conflicts any less uh, 
uh, you know, the, each, each uh, uh, group, which is not just Sunnis and Shias, but within the Sunnis and Shias and different political groups, want to shape the country in a way which, and they want to control. So I don't know whether that answers your question. <sighs> If I could follow up on that, um, if we um, if we look at middle class life in Iraq, uh, we see in modern times we see a lot of intermarriage, for example. Particularly in Baghdad, I've seen numbers indicating as much as 20, 25 percent of the marriage of the marriages across sectarian lines. Yeah, this certainly is something that mitigates sectarianism and so on. Mm. One imagines uh, also business mm. partnerships yeah. over time, mitigating sectarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, and we we're living through a moment of heightened sectarianism, maybe not as bad today as it was in 2006 mm -hmm. and 2007. But if you are sort of looking to the future, again taking out that crystal ball, how do you foresee the factors that will further mitigate as mm. opposed to promote sectarianism? Well, I think the restoration of normal life. You see, I, when you t talk about intermarriage, intermarriage everywhere uh, is a function of social and geographical mobility and of class. You know, it, if you, you tend to marry where you are. So, you know, if where you are is entirely Protestant or entirely Shia or what have you, you will marry a Protestant or a Shia. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm amused to say that uh, in England, apparently, the the invention and the introduction of the bicycle altered marriage patterns uh, in, especially in the provinces and the countryside, to a great extent. Because then, you know, young men and young women could get on their bicycles and sort of court in different places. You know, um, and that I mean, the, the fact in in uh, uh, in uh, Iraq. Uh, it was a regional question, not just Sunnis and Shias, you know, that uh, the southern provinces, especially for the poor people, were so mono, you know, they were so uniform that people didn't meet one another. So the intermarriage occurred in Baghdad, but not anywhere in Baghdad, in the locations of the modern middle classes. You know, universities were the best places for intermarriage. Um, so uh, uh, there are these factors. It's not just a question of sentiment or antagonism, uh, although of course that does play a part. You know that uh, uh, you know it's a bit. You know the this feeling that to for your daughter to marry somebody from another community is a kind of betrayal um, is very strong, and that doesn't have to be. Just a question of religion. It could be in a different uh, uh, tribe or city or what have you. Uh, so how do you overcome that? You overcome that by process of friendship. You know, of the mixing of the uh, the proce proceeding of the social division of labor, of the mixing of populations. Um, you see what happened. You had you had uh, everywhere in the world enormous volumes of migration from rural and provincial into the big cities. But often what has followed from this is not a kind of uh, diversification of the cities, but the peasantization of the cities. So, you know, you have, you have, you know, you have Sadr city, you know, what used to be called Revolution City, which then becomes a ghetto for people from, from the south who don't mix with anybody else. Um, so, I mean, these are the factors. It's not just a question of sentiment and religion. Yeah. I hate to ask you to take the crystal ball again. Yeah. But linking the crystal ball to questions of citizenship and Iraqi identity, as you look forward under the present government, do you see an ascendant, a new yet effectively ascendant model of Iraqi citizenship eventually emerging and stabilizing the situation in a manner that is inclusive of Sunnis? No. Sorry. 
Yeah. I'm sorry to have to say it, but no. Why not? Well, I mean, just looking at it now, it just. I don't know. Tell us why, yes. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say yes, but there is a possibility, of course. I mean, you know, most of the violence and this sectarianism um, is not an internal issue altogether. It's been influenced by the outsiders. Oh, they run on the one hand and, and so. <laughs> no, but it is true. It's yeah, but true. it's only I mean, the outsiders the can are, only are, do are, are, are going everywhere and then begging for support. And they are supporting on these bases. I mean, in, in Syria, for instance, and the, the, this struggle between an oppressive government and people who were suffering of that regime. But when the Gulf countries intervened, they, they, they deviated into sectarian war. It isn't. It didn't start as a sectarian war. So if external influence could be for some, somehow could be eliminated, I think Iraqis will, mm. will, will be able to make themselves together again. It has happened before. So Hafez al-Assad pulverizing Hama with thousands killed in 1982 has, nothing, has not brought about any sectarian sentiments in it, Syria. Well, I mean, these are opposite, uh, I mean, opposition. I mean, Saddam... Well, I don't know. It's just opposition. It is a particular kind of opposition. And of course, I think you're perfectly correct in saying that the movement in Syria, as elsewhere, started as non-sectarian. The people, the people who started these movements are not the people who are now leading it. And uh, that is not just to do with uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's, that's to do with, uh, with uh, history and memory and, and power relations and regional relations within Syria. Don't forget, you know, that in fact the main, the main, no, I don't want to go talk about Syria now. <laughs> no, but if you look at the history of Iraq, yeah. sectarian violence only took place when invaders came in. No, that's not true. Sectarian violence uh, was uh, very prominent under the Ba'ath. Sectarian violence uh, uh, flared up Again, very much in 1991. A, you know, a, a party uh, the, the when you look at the what do you call the the deportation of large numbers of Shia from Iraq and and be thrown on the Iranian border? That's if, not violence. If, if Saddam, if Saddam was sure that these people will be loyal to him, he would put them in the government. Oh, I but see. He, they are they, they they are a threat. Yeah. That's yes. A threat to him. Well, I mean, you referred, for example, to the exploitation, the expulsion of the failures. The fa not just failures. There yeah. were also a lot of uh, urban Shia, Arab Shia, also and, expelled. And these groups had not advanced opposition activities. That's my understanding. They were suspected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Of uh, possibly doing it, but they weren't doing it. But anyway, I think that's only one example of uh, the the violence against. And of course, you know, the 1991 events. Uh, the the Intifada of 1991, whatever the rights and wrongs of it, you know, after that it was never the same. The Anfal campaign. The Anfal campaign. It's uh, no, I mean, there's a a history of violence long before the invasion. The invasion, of course, made it worse. You're quite right. No, I, I didn't say only this invasion. Mm -hmm. the Iranian invasion before also mm -hmm. created this sort of sectarian. So do you agree, Hushang, it was an Iranian invasion? <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, what we might do at this point is bring the program to a formal close, but uh, if you agree, perhaps you can stay and chat for a while with people who care to, mm -hmm. and uh, for people who'd like to, uh, to meet uh, uh, Professor Zubeda, please come down front. But before that, please join me in thanking our speaker for a very <laughs>